An injunction has been granted against the pro-Palestinian demonstrators who've been occupying King's College Circle for the past two months. Good evening. Demonstrators have been given a deadline of 6 p.m. tomorrow evening to completely tear down their encampment. The court order also grants police the authority to arrest and remove anyone who defies the deadline. CTV's John Woodward has been following this story and he joins us live now with the very latest. John. Yeah, Michelle, the bottom line, all of the tents in this uh, area of the University of Toronto have to come down in uh, almost exactly 24 hours, 6 p.m. Wednesday, according to uh, a ruling about an injunction by the Superior Court. Also in that injunction, the barriers to entering this uh, patch of grass have to come down. The, uh, the uh, essentially the bouncers, if you will, at the edge of this uh, grass have to stop impeding access. Uh, and uh, it it was a, a, an injunction that looked at uh, both sides here, the, uh, taking seriously the university's right to control its property, but also, on the other hand, balancing the right to protest. The judge takes effort to say there's nothing that stops a protester from uh, doing, from, from making their views known between 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. Now, this injunction began May 2nd. Uh, as many as 177 tents uh, were here to raise awareness about the Israeli offensive in Gaza. Um, that number of tents has dropped substantially today. If you look around, you will see some of evidence of what the university has claimed was harmed to its property. Bare patches uh, of tents, uh, of grass that have been left left behind. Uh, and also, we, we're hearing reaction uh, from the protesters as well. Them saying, they're hedging their bets a little bit, not saying whether or not they will leave, but saying that their cause is just and they will continue to fight for it. Today, on 200, day 270 of the genocide in Palestine and day 62 of this encampment, we have just gotten word from the judge that the judge has sided with the University of Toronto and ordered U of T to end this encampment by 6 p.m. tomorrow. Instead of committing to divestment and ending its complicity in genocide, U of T is releasing violent police on its own students. Despite ordering the police violence, the judge, has, the judge was clear. Contrary to U of T's mischaracterization, the encampment is not violent and not hateful. But the law and the university care about private property above all else. So you're seeing now some of those patches of grass that are left behind by those moving tents. But the people, a lot of people in these tents are choosing to stay. And that brings us to the enforcement of this injunction. Previously, the police decided not to move in against this without an injunction. At 6 p.m. tomorrow, uh, they have new authority to come in and arrest uh, on contempt of court grounds. Uh, it's not entirely clear what happened. will happen in the past. Authorities have waited for their own moment, uh, what they find is most strategic to strike, but starting 6 o'clock tomorrow, I, all eyes will be on this field. Reporting live from the U of T, I'm John Woodward. Back to you. Thank you, John. And still to come on CTV News at 6, Toronto Police tap into our city's youth offering summer employment opportunities in priority neighbourhoods. We'll have more on the outreach program a little later in the newscast. A deal was reached between WestJet and its maintenance workers this past long weekend, but the airline is still dealing with the aftermath of the strike. Tens of thousands of travelers impacted over the past few days, and many of those issues are indeed continuing. CTV's Raheem Ladani has been speaking with travelers today, and he joins us live now with more. Raheem. Michelle and Nathan, as of this hour here at Pearson Airport, there have been 17 WestJet flight cancellations today and another 28 WestJet flight delays. This is the current situation, and it's, it's expected to last for at least the next several days. From frustration to desperation, WestJet passengers are searching for answers as to why the airline is no longer on strike, but they can't get on a flight. I just wanted to be on the first of July with my family and watch my kids go through the firework. I was just crying. Lawrence was supposed to fly home to Edmonton on Canada Day, but instead he's been stuck in Toronto, rebooked on a flight Tuesday night with a layover in Winnipeg. I had to call my job, tell them, sorry guys, I can't make it. This is what's happening. WestJet and its aircraft maintenance workers reached a five-year tentative agreement over the weekend. The three-day strike led to more than 1,000 flight cancellations. WestJet says it is going to take time to get back to normal operations. President Diedrich Penn says, across our airline, our teams are working around the clock to safely bring the 130 aircraft parked across Canada back to the skies as efficiently as possible. Meaning the travel chaos is far from being over. The last three hours, 
like the ping pong. I'm asking people, nobody can serve me. It hasn't been easy, but I cannot get hold on them. We found a nice lady here who, who tried at least to help us, but there were no, no connections left, so now we have to wait 24 hours. The added delay will mean more expenses. They didn't ever even want to provide us any accommodation or beverages, food, nothing. Under Canada's air passenger protection regulations, a strike falls into the category of outside the airline's control. That means compensation is limited to a rebooking or refund. I think everybody will learn their lesson off this experience and realize potentially the need for cancellation and interruption insurance because at this point that would be the only thing that would have saved all these people their expenses and costs. A travel nightmare that has some promising they won't book another flight with WestJet. Passenger rights experts suggest that people should still email WestJet and submit their expenses telling the company to pay up and that if they don't they suggest taking WestJet to small claims court. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Michelle, I'll send it back to you. Thanks, Raheem. One person has been arrested following a two-vehicle collision in Rosedale early this morning. The vehicles ended up on the lawn of a home, causing substantial damage to the property. CTV's Mike Walker has been following the investigation and joins us live with more. Mike. Well, Nathan, Michelle, Toronto Police confirming that the luxury SUV was stolen in the Young in Dundas area. They say the victim then chased after, which resulted in the violent collision here in the Rosedale neighbourhood. The damage is extensive after two Mercedes G-Wagons collided and crashed onto the front lawns of two homes in Rosedale early this morning. One of the vehicles police say was stolen. The force of the impact toppling trees, a stop sign, and one of the SUVs ended up in the driveway colliding with two other parked vehicles. You could hear the loud driving down the street and then the bang and then the screeching and then the big crash. It happened just before 2 this morning, and that's when Max immediately ran over to the scene. And that's when I heard, call the police, someone call the police, this guy's stolen our car. Toronto police confirming one of the Mercedes was stolen from the Young and Dundas area when they say the victim briefly exited the vehicle and left it running. They say the victim followed their stolen vehicle in another vehicle. I believe the stolen car was the one right here that crashed into these trees. He says four men got out of one of the G-Wagons and were holding the driver of the other G-Wagon on the ground. Seemed like one person stole the other person's car, so they chased them from downtown and they got him here. Um, they took him out of the car and they kind of held him there while, while I called the police. He took this video moments later after police arrested one man and loaded him onto an ambulance. The same person, he says, was pinned to the ground by the group of men. Toronto police say the suspect was taken to hospital to be treated for minor injuries. People will get hurt if that, that continues to happen. Neighbours shocked to see the aftermath, but given the surge in auto thefts, they are not surprised. All the time. It happens all the time. Our, neighbor, our neighbours had their cars stolen two, three times. Oh yeah, it's constant. Police towed one of the Mercedes away from the scene. The force of the impact sent brick pillars crashing through a front window of one home. The landscaper says the homeowners were away at the time. Next door, car parts litter the driveway. The rear end of this Audi was smashed in. The damage done here is unbelievable. The amount of speed that's going through here, it's really scary. A 19-year-old Toronto man is facing several charges, including auto theft and dangerous operation. He was scheduled to appear in court this morning. Reporting live, I'm Mike Walker. Nathan, back to you. All right. Thank you, Mike. And police are searching for a vehicle in connection with a recent spate of shootings targeting tow trucks over the weekend. The search comes shortly after a task force was announced to specifically crack down on tow truck violence. CTV's Beth McDonnell has been following this story, and she joins us live now with more. Beth. Michelle, the auto shop behind me is one of eight places where shots were fired over the weekend. Toronto police say all are tow truck related with the suspects getting away in a dark colored Honda CRV. Have a look at the video. In surveillance video obtained by CTV News, the shooter stolen suspect vehicle, a dark colored Honda CRV with its back window down, is seen going north shortly before nine at night Saturday before turning into an auto business. Moments later, a tow truck emerges from the same driveway and drives away, right before the Honda takes off from another point in the same direction. In minutes, police arrive, all while Tom Tanos is across the street listening to loud music. 
I heard, uh, well, police officers out there. I, I knew something happened, but uh, I didn't hear the shots. But there were shots, several, which hit three vehicles here, including this one, according to one man who works at the auto business. Meanwhile, Toronto police say the stolen Honda was involved in a total of eight shootings over the weekend between 2 in the morning Saturday and Sunday evening at 745, all causing damage to property at various locations in Scarborough and all tow truck related. Something we're uh, looking at as a whole of service uh, priority for us to do everything we can to not only stem the gun violence that's uh, going on as a result of uh, uh, challenges in that industry, uh, but also to bring those responsible to justice. An operations manager here said he's not scared because no one was hurt and police are looking into the gun violence. Just last week, launching a new tow truck task force. Conflicts in the GTA have historically been about territorial disputes and rivalries. Police say the intense violence only affects a very small segment of the towing industry and the new force will be looking at all eight shootings as officers search for the stolen Honda and the suspects who were inside. Police are appealing for information about the Honda CRV and the suspects. There have been more than 30 tow truck related shootings in Toronto so far this year. Reporting live on Birchmount, I'm Beth Magdanell. Nathan, back to you. All right, thank you, Beth. Hamilton police identified the victim of a fatal shooting over the weekend and gave an update on the investigation. Police were called to a stretch of Highway 6 near Concession 6 at around 4.30 Sunday morning. They say around 60 people have been attending a party at a short-term rental location in the area when there was an altercation which spilled outside. One person was shot and killed, and three others were wounded. As a result of the disturbance that took place inside the home, the altercation carried out onto the roadway, resulting in shots being fired at a parked vehicle along the side of Highway 6, as well as shots being fired at another vehicle in a nearby gas station. In the parked vehicle, one male was found suffering from gunshot wounds. He was transported to local hospital, where he later succumbed to his injuries. That person has now been identified as 45-year-old Tobina Obiaga from Halton Region. Police say witnesses saw a dark gray car speeding away from the scene, but have not been able to provide any other information about possible suspects. Toronto's police chief met with a number of teens today as the service marked the 18th anniversary of its Youth in Policing initiative. The event comes as the service tries to reach out to a younger generation following recent high-profile incidents involving youth. CTV's John Musselman has the details. It was quiet on Mount Olive Drive near Kipling this morning. Still, police confirmed there were gunshots in the area last night. No reported victims and no suspect information. It comes exactly one month after the mass shooting in the parking lot at North Albion Collegiate. Two men died and three others were injured. A 14-year-old boy was arrested in connection with the shooting. Longtime residents like Merva Marilyn Reese Walk says people here are fed up with the gun violence and the gangs. Okay, a lot of these children fast money okay they they get into gangs you know they get coerced oh you can get this you can get that you can get two thousand dollars whatever whatever give me a break go at mcdonald's and walk go at tim Horton and walk local pastor delroy sherman says there is a need for more youth programs in the community but he says more importantly there needs to be more police patrols in the neighborhood I, I would suggest to the chief in areas where it's more it's always a, a trouble there, we need to be patrol. We need to send out police in these areas. So living in this neighborhood, like everyone almost kind of like knows everyone. So it's like not being wanting to be on camera. It's like I don't want to be like targeted. Last week, the Toronto Youth Cabinet met at a nearby community centre to talk about gun violence and possible solutions. More programs, tougher gun control and a better relationship with police are key issues for young people living here. Strengthening ties between police and youth through positive interactions. Offering education and meaningful work experiences for youth. And that is part of the goal of the Youth in Policing initiative. There was a ceremony at the Toronto Police College today. The summer program looks to improve the relationship between police and young people in Toronto's priority neighbourhoods like Mount Olive. Residents say they just want to feel safe when they're out on the street. John Musselman, CTV News. 
An arrest has been made after a taxi driver was stabbed downtown last night. The incident happened shortly before 8 in the area of Lower Sherbourne and the Esplanade. Police say the taxi driver was stabbed following an altercation with a passenger. The driver suffered serious but non-life-threatening injuries. A 23-year-old man has been arrested in connection with the incident. And a 23-year-old man's body has been recovered following a drowning in Peterborough. Police say the man went into the water in Little Lake near a train bridge at Lansdowne and Edward Street last night. He began to struggle and another man entered the water to help but was unable to rescue him. The second man was treated at Peterborough Regional Health Centre. Police say the incident is now a coroner's investigation. An Ontario doctor accused of killing four patients has been acquitted on all charges. Dr. Brian Nadler was set to begin his trial in Ottawa when the Crown asked the court for directed verdicts of acquittal. The decision was based on a pre-trial ruling which excluded the evidence of the prosecution's expert witness. Nadler was facing four charges of first-degree murder and negligence in connection with the deaths of four seniors at a hospital in Hawkesbury. Nadler's lawyer said his client maintains his innocence and that the four patients died of COVID-19. The three forensic pathologists who conducted the four post-mortem examinations are experienced experts employed by the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service, an independent government agency. All, all four, unequivocally concluded that in each case, the cause of death was COVID-19. Nadler has been out on bail since July of 2021. His license to practice medicine was suspended after his first charge. All right, here's a live look outside tonight. We had a sunny and seasonal day, but the heat is starting to rise tomorrow. There's a live shot. Jessica Smith joins us now with more details and a look at the current conditions. Hey, Jess. Hey, we're watching a system starting to make its way in that will bring some active weather through parts of southern Ontario tomorrow. Not a downpour by any means, but this comes in addition to some intense heat and humidity that will start to push its way back in after a fairly seasonal weekend and fairly seasonal day today. We have that sunshine to start. We've since seen the cloud cover move in. Nothing active weather wise is happening for us tonight, but that will change into the day tomorrow. We're in the low to mid 20s, so we are still kind of holding on to that cusp before you feel that real intense humidity through the islands right now. We're sitting at 20 through Pearson 22, a little cloudier there tonight. All that heat, all that daytime heating not going anywhere. We're still sitting at 19. We should be at 16 into the day tomorrow. Those humid X values climbing well into the upper 30s. Those details in a moment right now. Back over to Michelle. Thank you, Jess. Not much to worry about in our neck of the woods, but a hurricane warning is in effect for Jamaica as a now Category 4 storm approaches after making landfall in the Southeast Caribbean. At least six people were killed when the storm stuck struck rather Grenada and Cariacou, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and northern Venezuela. Crews fanned out across the region to determine the extent of the damage and look for anyone requiring rescue. There is almost complete destruction in some areas after the weather system hit yesterday. Some roads are not passable and electricity has been lost. The core of the storm is now forecast to pass near or over Jamaica tomorrow. We are expecting a storm surge of five to eight feet above normal tide levels uh, on the coast of Jamaica, especially concerned in the areas around Kingston, those harbors and on the south side of the island. Going to be a very, very significant wave action on top of that as well. This is the first hurricane of the 2024 Atlantic season. A hurricane watch has been issued for Grand Cayman, Little Cayman, Cayman Brack and Haiti's entire southern coast. It's forecast to be near the Cayman Islands on Thursday and into Mexico's Yucatan. Peninsula Friday. At least 116 people have been killed in a deadly stampede at a religious festival in northern India. And as CTV's Judy Trin reports, it's one of the worst tragedies in more than a decade. This collapsed tent foreshadows the tragedy that unfolded in a village in northern India. Thousands crowded into the tent to hear a sermon by a Hindu preacher. Authorities say the stampede occurred near the end of the event as the worshippers surged towards the stage. People started falling on top of each other. Those who were crushed died, said this woman. More than 100 people were trampled to death. Bodies were transported to morgues to be identified, while ambulances took dozens of injured to hospital. 
the majority of the victims appear to be women and children. Exactly what sparked the stampede isn't clear, but officials say sweltering heat and overcrowding contributed to the chaos. There are more than 15,000 people gathered to honor the Hindu god Shiva, three times the amount of people who were permitted. In Parliament, Prime Minister Narendra Modi offered his condolences and said the federal government would work with state authorities to ensure the injured would get help. 200,000 Indian rupees, or more than $3,000, are being offered to victims' families. Deadly stampedes have happened before in India, where shoddy infrastructure often intersects with huge crowds. Both in 2011 and 2013, there were similar tragedies. Judy Trin, CTV News, Ottawa. Still to come, helping bring Shrek to the Toronto stage. Getting to know the local talent tapped to make the popular movie come to life will have his story a little later in the newscast. In the Middle East, Israeli forces bombarded several areas of the southern Gaza Strip today. Hospital authorities say an airstrike killed at least eight people in Deir al-Bala. They were displaced Palestinians who fled eastern Khan Yunus. Yesterday, Israel ordered parts of the city to be evacuated ahead of a likely ground operation. In the north, medics said 17 Palestinians were killed in Israeli shelling in a densely populated neighborhood of Gaza City. The Supreme Court delivered a major victory to former U.S. President Donald Trump this weekend, ruling he has some immunity for official acts while in office. U.S. Joe, uh, President Joe Biden slammed the decision, saying it sets a dangerous precedent. This decision today has continued the court's attack in recent years on a wide range of long-established legal principles in our nation. Biden claims the decision will embolden Trump and prevent the former president from being held accountable for his role in the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Legal experts say the ruling means it will be unlikely that Trump faces trial in several ongoing legal battles before the voters in the U.S. head to the polls in November. Rudy Giuliani has been disbarred as a lawyer in New York. A court found Giuliani repeatedly made false statements about Donald Trump's 2020 election loss. And this ruling means the former New York City mayor and Trump lawyer can no longer practice law. The court says it found Giuliani falsely and dishonestly claimed during the 2020 presidential election that thousands of voters were cast in the names of dead people and that some people were taken over state lines to vote twice as part of a conspiracy to support U.S. President Joe Biden. And the Biden administration has proposed a new rule to address excessive heat in the workplace, as tens of millions of people in the U.S. are under heat advisories due to soaring temperatures. If finalized, the measure would protect an estimated 36 million U.S. workers from injuries related to heat exposure on the job, establishing the first major federal safety standard of its kind. Those impacted by excessive heat include farm workers, delivery and construction workers, and landscapers. Indoor workers in warehouses, factories, and kitchens would also be covered. The head of Russia's space agency assigned the general schedule for the creation of a new Russian space station. The Russian orbital station will consist of modules similar to the International Space Station and for the first time in history it will enter an orbit that passes over all latitudes of the Earth, including the Arctic. The launch of the first scientific and energy module is scheduled for the year 2027. The second stage is between 2031 and 2033. Coming up, a major effort to advance at Wimbledon. A look at how the Canadians in action today fared at the All England Tennis Club. I'm Pat Four, and coming up on Consumer Alert, when you leave Canada for a trip, it's important to have travel medical insurance in case you have a health emergency. An Ontario man had a heart attack in a Florida airport and ended up with a hospital bill of more than $600,000. I'll have my reports. That's just ahead. And the heat is on as we head into the day tomorrow. So for the kids heading off to camp, or maybe you're a camp counselor, extra water, a really good idea. The Humidex values into the afternoon, into the mid to upper 30s, along with a chance of some messy weather. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long-range forecast. And stay with us. We have another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV.
Whenever you travel outside of Canada, it's important to have health insurance coverage in case you get sick or have an accident. But even if you have travel insurance, you still need to make sure your health is considered stable and that you're fit to travel. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. A man went to Florida this spring to spend time with his family, and when he was flying home, he suffered cardiac arrest at the airport. He felt he had the proper insurance, but after his hospital stay, his claim was denied, and he now owes more than $600,000. I was in shock. I cried. 73-year-old Richard Bishop of Tecumseh near Windsor is happy to be alive after suffering a cardiac arrest while visiting Florida. In March of this year, he was at the Orlando airport waiting to fly home when he collapsed. It took 14 minutes of CPR to revive him. I had 10 broken ribs and uh, that I'm, I'm recovering and moving now and, uh, you know, I'm good. The bishops have group travel insurance and checked to make sure they had coverage before they left Canada. When Richard was hospitalized, he needed a defibrillator, and as far as they were concerned, all the bills were covered. I yeah, provided them with the phone numbers to our doctors, uh, his doctors, cardiologists. The total hospital bill came to $620,000, and that's when the bishops found out they were not covered due to Richard having pre-existing conditions related to his heart. Cardiologist said that husband wasn't stable to travel. The family said if they would have known sooner the hospital bill would not have been paid, they would have taken an emergency flight home to have Richard's health addressed in Canada. After you get a, a $80,000 American defibrillator, they say, oh, we're not paying. A Green Shield spokesperson said due to privacy concerns, they couldn't get into specific details, but did say, we can confirm all claim decisions involve multiple levels of review with both internal claim examiners and external medical experts. If you do not declare all your conditions, you are subject to having the claim denied. Martin Firestone says a change in medication, a doctor's visit, or pending medical tests are all enough to void an insurance claim. Just to think you have travel insurance, it's just not enough in this time. You have to be careful to understand what you really do, in fact, have. The bishops say they aren't sure how they'll pay the huge hospital bill. I feel terrible that we had no assistance being flat on my back in the, the hospital. Firestone says in most cases, if someone owes a hospital bill in the U.S. at $600,000, often you can negotiate a lower amount. If you tell the hospital your claim was denied, you could pay hundreds of thousands of dollars less. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. Well, another nice day out there, the sunshine, and for the most part, pretty nice. It looks like it's clouded over a little bit, and I'm sure if you're on the water right now, maybe it's a little cool, but yeah. not bad at all. Yeah, no complaints today. We had a great day yesterday. Today's mm -hmm. good. Hopefully, this trend continues. Sort of. <laughs> we have a little bit holding on tomorrow, but we see that really intense humidity return tomorrow. The weekend wasn't bad, right? We had a bit of a, a soggy start. We had a bit of a breezy day on our Sunday, Monday as well, but it really was quite beautiful and very seasonal. Today, you felt that little bit of heat as you made your way outside this afternoon, and that intensifies into the day tomorrow. So keep that in the back of your mind as we head in towards the rest of the week, especially if you work outside. A shot from earlier today, though, beautiful in the city. And if you're an early riser, you kind of escape that heat. We're not in any kind of heat wave situation now, but as we head into the summer, if they do pop up, they say the best times to get out is early in the morning or later in the evening when we're not in that peak kind of heat. A beautiful shot, though, of the city skyline, and it's fantastic as we step into this short work week for so many. Now, temperature-wise, it is not bad right now. We're sitting in the kind of low to mid-20s across southern Ontario, but we're a little cooler to the north, and this is as we see a system up there pushing its way in. But for now, it is dry and it's relatively warm. We're sitting at 19. We should be at 16 for our low tonight. We would really like kind of easterly or southeasterly flow to the wind for the most part. Right across southern Ontario, though, we have all that daytime heating that we built up. That cloud cover moved in and kind of trapped a lot of that in there into the day tomorrow. We are fairly seasonal uh, in some parts of southern Ontario, but 
the human hex values are pretty uh, intense. We'll set at 29, we should be at 26, but it will feel closer to 37, 38 for us here in the city and across much of the GTA and almost everybody feeling in the mid to upper 30s. The bulk of the system that we're looking at right now affecting Ontario is north of us. We have another one kind of pushing its way in and we're kind of bookended by these as they push their way across the province. We're not looking at an intense amount of rain for us here in the GTA, but if you're traveling, and I know a lot of folks are maybe this week after the long weekend, keep that in the back of your mind. Just cloud cover as we head through our night tonight. Some sunshine to start the day tomorrow. The chance of active weather is kind of that late to mid afternoon window around four o'clock, but more of a sprinkle than anything else. Worse or more intense the further east and north you go. And then as we head in towards Thursday, we start off with sunshine and then that cloud cover moves in a little bit later in the day. But overall, it's not a bad week ahead. It's the humid X values I want you to pay attention to. 37 is what it feels like tomorrow. 30, uh, 638 as we head in towards that kind of midpoint and end of the week. And although we have daytime highs fairly close to seasonal. We don't get a break from the humidex values for the rest of the week. Another chance of rain as we head in towards our Saturday, but overall it's not bad. But if you're spending any time outside over the next few days, extra water and sun protection, a really good idea. Nathan, Michelle, send things back to you. All right. Thank you, Jess. In soccer, Brampton's Tejan Buchanan was injured in practice today ahead of Canada's quarterfinal match at Copa America 2024. The Inter Milan attacker sustained an injury to his lower leg. He was taken to a local hospital for further evaluation and treatment, but there's no word on the severity of the injury. Canada's training session was canceled for the day. The 25-year-old has won 40 caps for Canada and has, been, has seen action in all three Copa America games so far. The Canadians play Venezuela Friday in Dallas. Three Canadians were in action at Wimbledon today. Fernandez won her first round match. The 21 year old from Laval, Quebec, improved to 7 2 on grass this season. She will next face the winner of a match between Danish wildcard Carolyn Wozniak and American qualifier Alicia Parks. <laughs> Mississauga as Marina Sakuzic lost her Grand Slam main draw debut today. The 19-year-old qualifier was defeated by Katarina Sinyakova of Czechia. Sinyakova converted all 12 net points and four of 24 break points. Oh. <clears throat> again, same serve. On the men's side, Felix Auger Aliassime was in action, but the match was suspended after about three hours when they ran out of daylight. Oje Aliassim was leading, and the match should resume tomorrow. Thank you. Also tonight, the latest options to protect babies from RSV. Why medical experts believe the vaccines now available are critical. The highly contagious virus known as RSV can make babies seriously ill. There are new vaccine options to protect little ones from it, but as our health reporter Pauline Chan explains, they're not covered by Ontario at this point. There's now a few options available. Mothers need to know this. They need to know the risks. Jessica Cohn's second child, A10, was just a month old when he got respiratory syncytial virus from his older brother. Maybe for you or I, RSV is just a cold. But for a little baby that's one month old or, or newborn, I mean, it's devastating. There's no treatment for RSV. There's no cure for it. So you're just trying to help the baby to breathe. Their airways are so small. It's, it's difficult. And she spent two weeks in Chio in Ottawa while Eitan was seriously ill. But now there are two ways to protect infants from RSV. One is a vaccine given during pregnancy. It's known as a Brisevo and is also used to protect older Canadians from RSV. They want to take it between 32 to 36 weeks. The infants that are of pregnant people right now who will be born in the fall are going to be during the RSV season. The second option is given after birth, a vaccine known as Nercevimab or Bayfortis. Uh, that can be given after the baby's born up to 12 years of age if you're healthy, but up to 24 years if you have high-risk um, disease that could put you at high risk for uh, 
uh, RSV infection. But they are not yet covered by the province, and their Civimab is around $900, although some health plans may cover part of the cost. Dr. Vivian Brown says talk to your doctor about the options. This is all about shared decision making. Do you want to take a vaccine now as a mother to protect your baby when your baby is born? Or do you want to wait when your baby is born and see if there's a public health program? And Brown points out that even if the infant vaccine is covered, it may initially be only for those at the highest risk. Pauline Chan, CTV News. The H5N1 avian flu has now spread to more than 120 dairy cows in the U.S. Experts say it signals a change that could bring it closer to becoming transmissible between humans. They hope for a better coordination by different agencies on testing so any outbreaks can be addressed quickly. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention say officials have been monitoring for a novel, novel influenza virus for nearly two decades. It also says pasteurized milk remains safe to drink. Meanwhile, the U.S. government is spending millions to develop a bird flu vaccine. Moderna receiving $176 million to develop a potential shot against the avian flu. The vaccine will use the same mRNA technology which allowed for the rapid development and rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. Moderna plans to launch trials to test the safety and effectiveness of a vaccine which could be used to scale up a response to a potential bird flu pandemic. On the entertainment front, when Shrek the Musical comes to town next month, one of its unsung heroes is Harrison Roth. As CTV's Andrea Case reports, the young music director got his start right here in Toronto. When Shrek, Fiona and Donkey hit the stage in Shrek the Musical, they are doing so to the beat led by Toronto's Harrison Roth. Don't let his youthful appearance fool you. The 22-year-old is the music director of the touring show. Taking a step back from the limelight previously, he too was a stage performer. I get to sing every once in a while. We've had some karaoke nights with the show and the <laughs> cast, which is always fun. Uh, and I get to sing in rehearsals uh, when I'm teaching some of the music. but. Ultimately, the conducting, I find that the music direction aspect is so much more collaborative. I get to be able to interact with so many more people across the departments, um, and I find that uh, very fulfilling. He likens his role as being at the helm of a ship every night. He credits his time at the Etobicoke School for the Arts and meeting influential teachers, including Michael Vieira, who mentored yes. him along the way. And he was the one who would take me backstage and into the pit and allowed me to experience these shows amongst the musicians and really see what that was like. And that was by far one of the most pivotal moments in my career. As young as that career is, Roth continues to find lessons on the road. Shrek has taught me that accepting our differences is what's going to bring us together. All the things that make us special. It's a show for the entire family, and his family plans on taking it all in. It's a homecoming of sorts for Harrison Roth, so when Shrek the Musical opens here at the Princess of Wales Theatre on August 6th, he's going to need a lot of extra complimentary tickets. Andrea Case, CTV News, Toronto. Preparing for a sweltering summer. It's Wellness Wednesday on the show, and Dr. Alan Grill will be here with some tips for coping with the intense heat that is in the forecast. CP24 Breakfast, where Toronto gets its everything every morning. Despite our cause being just, the University of Toronto has not hesitated to call the police to intimidate and silence us. Time and time again, we've seen the administration resort to force rather than dialogue to address our legitimate concerns. An injunction has been granted against demonstrators at a pro-Palestinian encampment which has taken over King's College Circle at U of T for the past two months. Demonstrators now have until 6 p.m. tomorrow to clear out or police will arrest anyone who defies the order. Something we're uh, looking at as a whole of service uh, priority for us to do everything we can to not only stem the gun violence that's uh, going on as a result of uh, challenges in that industry, uh, but also to bring those responsible to justice. Toronto's police chief says the service is focused on cracking down on violence in the tow truck industry following a rash of shootings over the weekend. No injuries were reported, but a number of businesses and vehicles were shot at. Police are searching for a stolen vehicle in connection with the incidents. I had to call my job, tell them, sorry guys, I can't make it. This is what's happening. 
A worker strike at WestJet may be over, but the airline is still working to get things back up and running. Tens of thousands of passengers dealt with delays and cancellations over the long weekend, and some of the issues continue. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. Investors and governments have bet heavily on lithium batteries for the cars of the future, and they have been running into potholes. Andrew Bellabian and Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Swedish battery maker Northvolt will review plans for battery cell factories in Germany and Quebec after the ramp up of production at its first plant in Sweden was delayed. The money losing company is set to get billions of dollars in federal and provincial subsidies and support for the Canadian plant, but there has been a slowdown in electric vehicle adoption worldwide. Meanwhile, German chemicals giant BASF has killed off plans to invest in lithium mining in Chile. And U.S. broker Citi warns that lithium prices will slide as much as 20 percent in coming months, with stockpiles rising at a, quote, dramatic pace. On the markets, the Canadian dollar was at 73.15 U.S. cents, up a fraction. WTI oil traded at $82.81, down 57 cents. Western Canadian Select Oil traded at $66.27, down 25 cents. And the TSX Composite ended at 21,953.8, up just over 78 points. U.S. stocks closed at a new record high. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNM Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Claimants in an historic ruling against three major tobacco companies say nothing has changed over the last five years. In 2019, Quebec's highest court confirmed roughly 100,000 members of two class action lawsuits were entitled to billions of dollars after losing loved ones to smoking addiction or deaths. But five years later, none of the members have received a fraction of the money. And recent court filings suggest hundreds have died in the interim. These class action lawsuits uh, began in 1998, so were more than uh, 25 years ago. And uh, the, the strategy of the tobacco industry is delay, delay, delay. As part of this settlement, in terms of tobacco industry accountability, not only should there be compensation, but there also needs to be a ban on all remaining tobacco promotion. There needs to be significant long-term funding to reduce smoking and tobacco use. The three companies, Imperial Tobacco, JTI McDonald, and Rothmans, Benson & Hedges, were first ordered to pay in 2015 after a Quebec Superior Court found the companies chose profits over the health of their customers. After the appeals, courts upheld the landmark decision. The company sought creditor protection in Ontario. Still to come on CTV News, going for gold on the court. Canada's Olympic women's basketball team was unveiled today, and the roster features a number of Ontarians. Tonight, a deadly start to the hurricane season. A historic hurricane barrels through the Caribbean, bearing an ominous warning of more devastating storms to come. We'll have that story and more later on CTV National News. The Paris Olympics are set to begin later this month, and Canada is hoping for a strong showing on the basketball court. Today, the roster for Canada's Olympic women's basketball team was announced. From Milton, Ontario, Kayla Alexander. The roster features 12 athletes, including nine from Ontario. Canada qualified for its fourth consecutive Olympic Games by finishing third in a FIBA qualifying tournament in February. Paris marks the eighth overall appearance for the Canadian women in the Olympic basketball tournament. And the first time in 24 years, the women and men will compete together at an Olympic Games. The women's team is currently fifth in the FIBA standings. Time together has been a really important part of our women's program. These women have dedicated, some of them, they've been 13 years in our women's program. You know, some of them, it's their second year. And so I am eternally grateful to each and every one of them 
that are on this Olympic roster, but also I want to highlight the importance of those who um, may not have made the Olympic roster, but who have contributed to our preparation. Since Tokyo, this team has really been invested in 365-day basketball. And that's probably an untold story. What doesn't get seen is the amount of work that our athletes and team put in in windows in February, March, June, July, August, November, sometimes when the world isn't watching, sometime in gyms, somewhere in Canada where there are no fans, but the work is being put in to make sure that they represent Canada at their best. The team will travel overseas to Belgium and Spain as they continue their training camp and exhibition schedule. Their first game at the Olympics is July 29th against France. Holly. Should be good. Good luck to them. Getting close to the Olympic Games. Can you believe it? The Olympics are almost here. And tomorrow we're already at the midweek mark and we're getting a little heat cranked up. The heat is on. You know, we're getting all excited for the summer season. And we had that kind of late June or mid-June heat wave. And then we kind of cooled down a little bit for the end. We had a really seasonal start. And then now we are settling into not necessarily a heat wave. We don't kind of step into heat warning criteria. But the humid index values get really warm. So take that into consideration. It's a busy time. A lot of camps happening. A lot of outdoor activities, festivals. You're going to need the extra water. That rain that is kind of on that eastern shoreline of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay stays at bay for this evening. But as we head into the day tomorrow, we're watching for the system to kind of expand and bring some midday showers. But for now, it is dry, just a little cloudy out there. And temperatures in the mid-20s or low 20s feeling into the mid-20s. Into the day tomorrow, the heat is on. We climb up to 29. It'll feel like 37 when you factor in the humidex. And we're watching for those midday showers. Not a wash, but just for everyone spending time outside tomorrow, water is good. Good to know. Thank you, Jess. That's it for us, but be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zraida Allman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.